Now I'd like to welcome our next panel to the table and to the stage. This panel is the Ecosystem for Sustainable Entrepreneurship, and it's moderated by Tony Perkins, the founder and editor of Always On. So if we could have the panelists join us on the stage. Thank you. So how's everybody doing? Uh, I really appreciate being here. Um, you couldn't have chosen, or the organizers couldn't have chosen a more local Silicon Valley kid than me. I was born uh, at Stanford University Hospital, and I have to say, as such, every time I come to Berkeley, I kind of break out in a little bit of a sweat. Uh, I, I also need to keep up with the Stanford game, so every time they score we, you know, against USC, can someone scream or something so that I can keep motivated here. Um, again, I was born in Silicon Valley, grew up in Menlo Park, the venture capital of the world. I met Steve Jobs when I was 12 years old. He was in a, a little group called the Home Computer uh, Brew Club or, or Home Brew Computer Club. Uh, which my older brother was in, and I remember him showing me that little video game on called Pong, where you just kind of hit the ball back and forth on the screen, and he was really excited about it, and I wasn't so sure that it was that exciting. Uh, he did say that everybody was going to have a personal computer someday, and I really w thought that seemed kind of odd. Um, but obviously he, he proved us all, or at least my cynic side of me, wrong. Um, spinning forward, I had the great pleasure of being at the beginning of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, and I think you know this whole session is about you know the ecosystem, about sustaining entrepreneurship. Silicon Valley Bank has about 80% market share when it comes to servicing venture capital-backed companies, and back in 1983, at whatever 23 years old, I brought in a deposit uh, for two million dollars. It actually a, it was a connection through a, a young lady who I went to dancing school with, of all things. Her father was a venture capitalist and liked me, so he said, hey, he gave, Don, it was Don Lucas, who was most famous for being the first investor in Oracle, and only investor in Oracle, and made a, you know, quite a lot of money there. But he had given a company a two million bucks and told him to go uh, give it to me so that I could in, uh, put it in the bank, and little did he know, when I deposit in the bank, I boosted the bank's assets by 10%. Uh, I pushed it over $20 uh, million. Spinning forward, uh, Silicon Valley Bank is a $30 billion bank. Uh, so I think that poetically really kind of tells you uh, how the world has grown, how entrepreneurship, uh, just by that uh, example. Uh, in 1993, I started a, a little magazine on really bad paper and two colors uh, at the, when, when it first came out. It was called Red Herring Magazine. Uh, and at the time, uh, there were only two million people on the internet. With spin forward, of course, there's something like six billion devices now connected to the internet. Uh, in the second issue, I interviewed Bill Gates, who was uh, all about uh, owning the information superhighway, but at that time it w had nothing to do with the internet. It was about two-way cable. Uh, Larry Ellison was, I interviewed a couple issues after that. He was also uh, going to take over the in information superhighway, but uh, again, he was talking about uh, not the internet, but about two-way cable. Uh, so it just shows you that even the real smart guys don't get it right. Uh, it was, of course, Jim Clark uh, and Mark Andreessen, who was 21 at the time, who really were the great pioneers and the evangelists, uh, and were the ones who predicted and rightfully and evangelized, along with Yahoo, uh, John Dora, Kleiner Perkins, and a very small group of people uh, that began uh, the whole internet as a commercial uh, network uh, revolution. Um, I would just say, in summary here, uh, that I, you know, I, I've had the great privilege of seeing uh, the, ex the, the growth of the Silicon Valley. I have a new term for it. Uh, I call it the global Silicon Valley. That's a little bit self-centered, but I, I, I do not believe that Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is really no longer a description of a geography. 
Uh, it's a description of a state of mind, and you're all part of that, uh, both those of you who have come to America, those of you who were born here, and those of you who are visiting. And uh, for all those who have made that journey from Iran, I welcome you. Uh, so now what we're going to do is uh, we have a very terrific uh, panel here, uh, and they're each going to give their perspective. Uh, from what I can tell, we have four folks that are uh, living here and primarily operating here, and then we have three who are from our guests from Iran. Now, given uh, that I'm a local American boy, I can promise you that throughout this session I will be pe speaking perfect English. Uh, but when I introduce these fine gentlemen, uh, it, my pronunciation will probably not be very perfect. So if you'll excuse me in advance, uh, I will proceed. Uh, each gentleman is going to come up after their introduction and give a little three to four minute presentation, and then we will uh, join back together as a panel, and we'll have all sorts of fun after that. Uh, the first gentleman uh, with whom I know the best uh, is my dear buddy, Saeed uh, Am Amidi. I think I got that right, Saeed. I know him as the man. Um, Saeed is the founder, of course, and CEO of Plug and Play Tech Center, the premier technology startup accelerator with over 300 companies, which collectively and amazingly have raised a whopping $750 million. Additionally, Saeed is a general partner at Amazad. Of course, everybody in Silicon Valley that gets a little coin in their pocket can't help but be an, an investor, and he's done quite well at that. Uh, the fund has been investing in technology companies for over 15 years and holds successful investments in over 70 technology companies, some of which are PayPal, PowerSet, Danger, Bix, PowerSet, Dropbox, which is a big one, Lending Club, which is another big one, Zeusk, and et cetera. I think et cetera is going to be your biggest winner. Uh, Saeed is a serial entrepreneur and a seasoned executive with over 28 years of experience in founding, operating, and growing successful companies. He has successfully started and grown business both nationally as well as internationally in countries such as Spain, Italy, France, uh, Australia, and wow, another country that I have not heard of called etc. No. But I mean, when you look at this, Spain, Italy, France, it, maybe uh, you like going to those countries, Saeed. So uh, anyway, without further ado, let's bring up our good uh, friend, Saeed. Thank you so much. You know, guys, it's great to be here among such uh, people that have uh, high education, high uh, hard work and such a success story like Kamran. I have a little story to tell about Kamran a little later on. But I just thought, you know, a little bit changing the scene to say how I became an entrepreneur. So I moved to California after being in East Coast for five years, and I moved to Sand Hill Road. How many of the visitors know Sand Hill Road? It's sort of like 50% of the venture capital money in US at least comes from like a two, three mile radius. Little I knew, because while I was on Sand Hill Circle, I didn't know what happens inside of the circle, which is like Sequoia, KP, Redpoint, et cetera. They were investing in technology companies. And outside of the circle is one of the best golf courses in Northern California. So lately, I only spend time inside of the circle and outside of the circle. But the, <laughs> but the story goes that we had a townhouse there, and I was kind of living a very luxury life. Like many Iranians who went to school, I was going to Menlo College. And then because of the Iranian Revolution, my father shows up, then my mother shows up, then my uncle shows up, and they totally ruined my style. <laughs> you know, we had an unbelievable time at that time. We had a party every Friday night. I had a friend at Seagram who provided us with cheap booze and quality booze. We served champagne. And then the Iranian Revolution, for me at least, was the biggest blessing. And 
my father showed up, and then that's when I started to realize that's not reality. And I started my first company in 1979, two, three weeks after my father showed up. And that company, we build it to a couple of hundred million dollars, about a thousand people. It's in packaging business, bottled water business, and real estate. And then we kind of wanted to get into technology. And I called my friend Kamran Elahian, who took a couple of companies public. And I went to see him in his office in Palo Alto. And I said, I want to learn how to invest in technology companies. And I am not an engineer, but I want to see how you could build great technology companies, sort of like I knew how to build other companies. And he was a great mentor to me. And then he also taught me how to play golf. But uh, kind of like I want to just leave with a message that if you want to do something bad enough, you can succeed. In my case, I became an entrepreneur because I had to, to keep the standard of living that I have. So just to tell you in the last sort of minute, we did start investing in companies. This is our portfolio. We invested, for example, in Zeusk, which is a Berkeley startup. Uh, Alex was studying his MBA, and they just filed for IPO. So we kind of invest in early stages, like the companies in the bottom, and then we pray a lot so they go up and increase value. Along the way, we also introduce them to VCs and other investors. And then we can go to the next slide. More than money for every startup, I think is their first customers or first revenue. Lately, e-commerce and consumer internet is really big, but I really think in the future, B2B business will be also very strong. And now we work together with some of these corporations in different verticals to accelerate startups. I will close with this. We help about 300 startups per year. We invest in about 100. And they come, some from Bay Area. But as uh, Tony said, we also do this in Berlin, Spain, and about one third of our startups come from overseas. So again, it's a wonderful event here. L I would love to invite you guys, especially the people who are visiting from far, to come to plug and play at four o'clock on Monday. And we sort of show you what happens in Silicon Valley in just one place, which is connection, building their dreams, and realizing the value together with the entrepreneurs. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Uh, Robert Babai is uh, from, uh, operating from the USA, uh, and he's a managing partner at the Vector IP Law Group. His practice focuses on client counseling, patent, prosecution, licensing, and litigation. So without further ado, let's welcome Robert. Thank you. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Kamran and Amir for inviting me. And um, uh, what I wanna talk about is uh, the uh, challenges and opportunities that exist uh, with respect to patent laws in Iran and uh, uh, as you know, patent law is part of the intellectual property system, which includes uh, trademark, uh, copyright, and uh, trade secrets. And um, uh, so um, one of the first uh, <clears throat> things that I think is important uh, to know is that, um, uh, if you could go to the next slide. So the both um, United States and Iran are governed by certain patent laws, and the essence of patent laws are that you grant um, monopoly uh, in return for inventors disclosing their inventions so that the public can use them uh, in the future. So that's the essence of what we know, uh, what we call patent law, and that's what uh, really governs the system. 
in the United States, <clears throat> uh, the, the patent system is um, got its roots from uh, days of uh, statue of monopoly where uh, in England, uh, people were able to get monopolies for their inventions, but they were only limited to a very few uh, privileged and wealthy people because the requirement for that was uh, for you to be able to get a monopoly, you had to make and use, uh, actually manufacture your invention. And the founding fathers in this country did away with the working requirement, which meant that basically you had a system, a patent system for the common man, where all of a sudden thousands of people uh, were able to use their innovation in order to uh, make a living and uh, uh, be able to um, <clears throat> live a very, very wealthy life to uh, improve the, um, can you go back uh, to the, um, so uh, Thomas Edison and GE are prime examples of uh, the time that you, know, you were able to uh, monetize your inventions and what happened as a result, if you go to the uh, next slide, is you have uh, um, a number of companies that uh, re uh, were created uh, under two different regimes. What was the, what I call the Route 128 culture, which was where MIT was with its uh, research and also Silicon Valley culture where uh, you had the Stanfords and Berkeleys. And there, there was a distinction between the cultures, by the way. The Route 128 culture was very insular and proprietary, whereas the Silicon Valley culture was very open and open to collaboration. And actually, you see some of the companies in, the, in this side are no longer there, like digital, but all the other companies that have thrived. And this is really um, one reason for this is the fact that there is a huge level of intellectual property that is respected in this country. And, um, and that's what has made the patent system in the United States the envy of the world. And what happened was you had a world intellectual property organization that was created as a result of this. We go to the, and under this uh, system, you can file one patent application and be able to simultaneously pr protect your invention in 148 countries. But so happens that the 148th country is Iran which is the last country that were, came under the regime of patent cooperation treaty. Well, but as soon as Iran joined the patent cooperation treaty on July 4th, 2013, the number of patent filings in Iran dropped quite drastically by 90%. By the way, this information is provided to me by law officers of Dr. Lagoy, which I'd like to recognize here. And the reason for that is that the system the uh, infrastructure doesn't exist for us in Iran, in Iran to implement what patent cooperation uh, 3D requires. The examination process in Iran has become bogged down by having 26 different examination authorities to win uh, uh, their inventive uh, uh, examination and um, the quality is not very well. But you know, that's a challenge that requires addressing, but the opportunities are, in fact, that has been discussed here amongst everybody, is the very, very vibrant um, Iranian um, population that has a lot of innovation, and um, the number of universities that exist in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in Iran is highest in the region. There are 25% uh, of the students in Iran are engineering students, 24.2 uh, are studying in medical and health field, and with the help that would come from this side of the bridge, um, I think the, 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 that's where the opportunity lies in order to improve innovation through a very, very effective patenting system. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so our, our, the next gentleman is a professor here, uh, Hamid Godusi. Uh, Hamid is an assistant professor of finance at the Howe School of Technology Management, uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, and a member of Board of Directors, International Associa Association of Iranian Managers. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Hamid. Good afternoon. Thanks to organizers for having this wonderful event and uh, giving the opportunity to me to be here to speak for a few minutes. Uh, if I can get the PDF presentation slide, that would be great. All right, 
So my talk is focused on entrepreneurial finance since the panel is about the ecosystem of uh, VC and uh, entrepreneurial startups in Iran. I thought I'd focus on the financing part to set stage for further discussions and try to highlight a co few components of the existing systems and the challenges ahead. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? All right, so, well, I'm not seeing the bottom of my slide, so I can, there are some in the bottom. Okay, so just to, to give you an overview of what do we have there, because from outside we may think, okay, there is no basically VC and entrepreneurial finance system there, but as someone who has been working with Iranian entrepreneurs since 2000, almost the early stages of when the concept came to the country, we already have a couple of layers of entrepreneurial financing mechanisms. The biggest and the oldest one is the government sponsors ones. I did a back of envelope calculations. The promise for this year's budget is exceeding, thank you, great is exceeding $500 million, which is, which is a sizable amount, comparing that the VC capital in the US is around $30 billion a year. For a country like Iran, it's a huge amount of money. The question would be the right allocation to the people who need it. Historically, the government-sponsored initiatives provided money in terms of the debt financing. So we have a network of provincial uh, technology parks who have the, the funds to give we have the, the Elites Foundation who gives foundation, uh, financing to startups, and then a few other specialized ones like the Electronics Fund, et cetera. They used to use the uh, debt financing mechanism. Recently, they have moved towards the equity financing. For instance, the Sharif VC, which is, thank you, affiliated with Sharif University, they are now using the equity financing mechanism. So that they are the major players. Unfortunately, they are usually run by government bureaucrats rather than like uh, experienced entrepreneurs. The second layer are the commercial VCs, which are just emerging in the country. The first types are the strategic VCs. The example would be Shenasa, run by Dr. Jamal Mardi, affiliated with FANUP Group. And the financial VCs, which are coming to the play, I think the one run by Mr. No Shadiv, affiliated with Salman Bank, Avatek, would be another example. These are in the early stage. And the banking system is the last result, but you need a lot of heavy secure uh, a mortgage for getting loan from them. And what we don't see there are angels. It's almost an absent component in the current system. We have a set of challenges. It seems to me the biggest one is the valuation. Basically, the art of valuation requires a lot of experience. It requires seasoned entrepreneurs, and we don't have this built place there. So that's the biggest uh, conflict point between VCs and uh, entrepreneurs in terms of the right value of the company and the right way of dividing the shares. In terms of VC skills, I think we are lacking the mentoring and advising capacity in existing VCs because you need, as I said, experienced entrepreneurs sitting in VCs and we don't have this component there. For growth capital, we don't have any entity yet there. So we don't have private equity firms who can come after VCs and try to take firms there. I don't remember any VC-backed firm going IPO to Iran, so we don't have this part of experience. The legal structure for PE and slash VC is non-existent, so it's hard to established uh, investment firm as, as specialized as PE and VC and then attract money from asset management firms. And then the pr problem with the exit strategies, there is almost no private placement mechanism, so you cannot sell your VC-sponsored startup to another PE, usually they have to continue with the business. The only two examples of successful IPOs were Dr. Ghassan and Mr. Uh, Nazari's uh, firms. These are the only one I remember that they went through the stage and finally went, uh, investors could cash off through taking them to IPO. And then the bankruptcy procedure is very painful. We don't have the specialized court when the firm goes to bankruptcy. We don't have the economic-minded judges who can help transferring ownership from bankrupt one. And the other list, but these are, I think, the prime challenges which probably we can help as people who have seen the play here. And let me just spend 30 seconds on introducing our bridge. So we are in the International Association of Iranian Managers, we are trying to work as a bridge. We are trying to organize talks and workshops for people who have the experience outside of Iran and they want to share it with people there. Since the starting in 2005, we have organized around 200 lectures and workshops. And now we have a new initiative. We call it One Trip, One Seminar Initiative. It's that if you are going to Iran, if you are working on business and economy, please go to IAIM. If you are working on science, technology, and engineering, please go to NODIF. There is a form. Just introduce yourself, and then we will find you the right institution, the right type of 
audience, and then we'll organize the rest of it for you. And we might be able to finance a little bit of your event trip, you could reimburse part of your venture. So hopefully, this initiative can help us overcome a few of these challenges through the knowledge transfer to the country. Thank you so much. Great. Our next gentleman is uh, going to be coming in remotely uh, from Iran, uh, Riza Karami, Karami uh, who is an enterprise architect and IT strategy consultant, currently running Goldsoft, uh, which is a private IT consulting company in Iran. So hopefully uh, Reza will be coming in remotely, right? To answer to the question that uh, what can we do to improve the social capital? We must first understand the structure or the architecture of social capital as a whole. Shortly speaking, the sense of social capital is networking. And in order to make it possible, two groups of factors are necessary. In the technical side, we must form and develop social networks and tools for knowledge sharing, tech markets, and so on. In the institutional side, we need to, to develop professional associations, business societies, and NGOs. Uh, what we do in NGOs like Iran ICT Guild organization is in this line. And I think the main function of such NGOs is to improve social capital by developing an infrastructure of trust between different players of business environment, which is vital for development of a sustainable ecosystem of entrepreneurship in societies like Iran. Thank you. All righty. Uh, the next uh, gentleman, uh, interestingly, uh, was ranked by Forbes magazine as one of the most successful angel uh, investors in the United States. Uh, United States. Uh, Pejman Nozad is the founding managing partner of Pejman Mar Ventures, a $50 million seed and early stage venture capital firm focusing on groundbreaking tech startups. Pejman. Salam uh, Amigi. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I actually uh, would like to sincerely thank my colleagues and friends who are here from Iran. I have the utmost respect for you. Nazi and John, I, I love to clone you here 10 times, so you're an amazing entrepreneur. Be bachay Iran, I'm salam mikunam. Omidaram ki yeruz bebi namitun. Khoshalam ki inja hasam. Bachay volleyballam ki yeruz bordan raftan juzi charta team. دو هفته پیش هم مریم میرزاخانی جایزه معادل نوبل ریاضی رو برد یکی جلوی ایرانی ها رو بگیره. I actually want to thank Carmen Lahian for your amazing speech. Carmen, I hope one day I get a chance to talk about I, Carmen, while you're alive. Um, I want to share a personal story and Roy John, please don't count it at this for a minute. Okay, thank you. Because um, I think it tells you a little bit about my background, who I am, and just the journey of entrepreneurship. And this just happened this morning when I came to, um, took an exit to come to Berkeley. I remember that the first Persian food I have in the U.S. was here in Berkeley, and I tell you the story. I came here in uh, March 1992, straight from Iran, by accident. So I did not, I had $700 cash, I, I couldn't speak one word English. And I lost the whole money in the, the first two weeks. And a few of you know who know me why. I was in love with the girl in Iran, and I thought, I'm going to lose her. So I tried to call her every day from payphone. And, I, and at that time, you know, there was no internet phone. I didn't know. So I lost all the money. I started to work very hard, go to college at night. And the first thing I did when I saved some money 
So I said, I have to have Persian food. So I didn't have Google, and somebody said, you have to go broccoli to this small restaurant. So I spent like $20, $30, but the food was only $7. And I came here, I had the best Persian food of my life here. I, the reason I share this one with you, because you know, entrepreneurship, success, whatever you want to call it, is, is not a, it's not a quick thing, it's a journey. I, I love that $7 Persian food. I love what I did then, and I love what I'm doing right now uh, when I'm managing so many millions of dollars. So do what you really love to do. Um, I want to touch um, what actually Tony said is about Silicon Valley. Um, I think Silicon Valley is not a place. It's not an institutional, um, it's not a financial institution. Certainly it's not about capital. Silicon Valley is a culture, uh, a culture that really promotes entrepreneurship. And perhaps, you know, it started 40, 50 years ago when Hewlett Packard started HP at their garage uh, in Palo Alto. Today, if you, if you walk in downtown Palo Alto, you go to coffee shops, you see entrepreneurs are you know, pitching their ideas to investors. There are many mentors um, openly share their time and experience with CEOs. And even you see attorneys you know, discussing complex legal matters with CEOs. This is Silicon Valley. And, and if you really want to copy Silicon Valley somehow in Iran, we really have to build the culture first. Um, and it won't happen overnight. Um, I understand the legal infrastructure and governmental challenges, but, but I think we need to build a platform that um, promotes entrepreneurship. Um, but there is one important element that, that is absolutely crucial to do that, and that's sacrifice. I think if you're here to find out what are the opportunities in Iran and you know, make investment, make money, or make more money, I think this is very short-sighted. I think we need to sacrifice for the future generation. There is a generation here who has been successful either in Iran or here. We have to make the sacrifice in order to make things happen. It should come from me, it should come from Karman Elahian, it should come from Dr. Ghassim Zadeh, it should come from Mahmoud Nazari. So I think we, we have the background. Iran has been you know, center of innovation for a few hundred years. We had Farabi, Khwarazmi, Ibn Sina. I don't see why we cannot be a center of innovation in the world. I want to thank you. And so I have a short video here. I think Rajan is ready now, but let me, let me tell you. So I, I manage a $50 million seed fund as, and we invest very early stage startups. One program that we started last year, we selected 15 top students from Stanford. While our students, we invited them to come to our um, hacker space in downtown Palo Alto. We opened up our ecosystem and we didn't take any equity. So we, we, didn't, uh, we, asked, we, don't, we didn't ask for equity, no ownership. And as a result of that program, this summer, we picked eight teams from Stanford and we offered them 12 weeks work with our mentors in our space. We gave each, each team $25,000 on uncapped note, means there was no valuation set up, whatever in the future. Out of that eight teams, four teams died. So we lost all of our money for that four teams. But the, the rest of the four teams, two of them quitting Stanford, one of them got an offer a million dollar, a $10 million valuation from top tier VCs, and the other one is raising $2 million. This is a short video about this program.
So uh, it's fantastic. Uh, we have Parad Ranama here, who is from Iran. Uh, from his uh, little background here, he uh, is obviously the man uh, from Iran. He is an industrialist, an angel investor, and a VC who's helped establish and grow companies in five different industries in Iran over the last 40 years. Uh, so Farad, we welcome you uh, and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. با سلام خدمت دوستان ایرانی که اینجا هستن و دوستان ایرانی که در ایران احتمالاً ان شاءالله دارن گوش میکنن. Um, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the um, wonderful event and the organizers have really done a great job. I congratulate you. Uh, I, I'm really very impressed. Um, after such distinguished guests, um, really, um, I cannot add too much to it, but maybe my experience in Iran, uh, even the recent experience in the past 10 years, recent is 10 years um, at my age, uh, might be helpful uh, to bridging the gap between Iran and the rest of the world. Um, I have been involved through in manufacturing, in um, nanotechnology, invest, invested in that, uh, in uh, various other areas of uh, manufacturing, like solar energy and so on. But my passion and my um, excitement comes from the IT industry and seeing the young people of Iran um, entering into this unknown uh, area as far as they're concerned. I happen to be on the board of uh, juries of the Sheikh Bahai uh, Entrepreneurial Festival, which uh, celebrated its 10th anniversary this year. And there I could see how the talent uh, would uh, flourish and has flourished in, in the past years. Now, um, the quality of, of the participants is amazing. They are truly world class. And I'm very proud to be part of that. And um, uh, um, it is quite impressive. Uh, we, we hope we might be able to do the same thing there uh, to put it online so others can, can uh, get, get an idea of what's going on. Um, the discussion that, that is to be uh, uh, carried on in, in the Q&A is really about the atmosphere of entrepreneurship in Iran. Uh, and um, I would address that in a, in, in, uh, in a short time in this way that what would, if I am a young, uh, bright student, how can I, and I have some, some great ideas, I have some good friends, how can I uh, start a company? Where can, where can I go? Um, which organization would really help me? Uh, do people in Silicon Valley help me or is there somebody in, in Tehran that is going to, to uh, hold my hand and, and show me um, how to proceed? Uh, for that, of course, there's a whole list of organizations, some of them government, owned, some of them uh, private, some uh, from education authorities. There are over uh, 100 um, technology parks in universities in Iran, so that is an area that, that uh, helps a great deal. But nothing, of course, replaces the animal spirit that exists here that you really want to go and get it and, and conquer the world. That mentorship is missing in, in Iran. And in our companies, um, we have a group of companies called Ranema.com uh, that um, has about 15 startups there in various stages of development. And so we, we try to infuse this kind of attitude. Um, and more important, the structure of ownership um, to them, we take Silicon Valley as as a 
great example of how uh, stock options are given to workers right in, from the beginning and how uh, energized they, are, they become. And this, in my opinion, has been the success that we have enjoyed, that everybody in our group is a, an owner. Um, and uh, they don't look at their watches, they don't clock in at a certain time, their, their work is their life. And uh, this really is something that I would like to try and propagate throughout the um, uh, Iranian um, scene, if one can call it that. Um, the other uh, issue that um, we, we have addressed is that we have not counted on any banks or any um, government help in uh, getting capital to uh, use as uh, um, venture capital uh, or an angel uh, fund. Uh, we have done it through private um, people that, that uh, have been willing or been persuaded to join in. And so um, we've seen a great deal of success. Um, Perhaps um, the uh, figures would um, sh show for people who are in this business some idea of what uh, potential the one has achieved in the, in the last few years even. Um, that we would have, we could say that now, every day we have more than six to seven million people um, logging on on their mobile phones and uh, texting or sending uh, messages, participating in games, in competitions, and so on. Um, this is a major um, asset that, that uh, we, 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 ha we have here, here, and we see that um, the information that we gather and the data that, that can come from these uh, seven, eight million people um, is truly valuable and it can be processed to, for the betterment of, uh, of the society. So the, mm, uh, what we have tried is to change attitudes towards uh, entrepreneurship. Mm, one of the issues was, that, and the challenges that was uh, the culture of uh, failure um, risk or risk-taking in Iran, it is synonymous with danger. It's khatar pazir, danger-friendly, really, uh, which is a, a very strange term. But that's how it is. So uh, fa a failure uh, will result in, thank you, um, a shame for, for somebody who is uh, involved. And that really uh, hampers um, the, the, the march forward of, of, of the young people. Uh, we're trying to um, address this, try to help them. Um, we, as one of our friends here, Dave, I think, uh, or Kamran, uh, challenged each other to invest in Iran uh, ten, 10 companies in Iran. I'd like to return the compliment and uh, uh, challenge them that whatever they do, we are prepared in our group to invest in five new startups uh, of their choices or, or uh, of our mutual choices. So let's get something going there. Thank you. I'll finish because my time is running up. Out, uh, I think, but um, just one final p point that uh, we did a lot of work. We um, became bankrupt a couple of times, but we um, picked up again, and we really had a hard time. Now we are doing excellent. I couldn't dream of uh, uh, going to any other industry but IT, uh, and if somebody tells me, 
uh, what would you do as the question went? I think I would do it all over again with gusto. Thank you very much indeed. All right, so now we get to have the interactive fun part. So uh, I'd like to uh, just start out. I mean, I can say that the, I couldn't live anywhere else in the world because, uh, as Mark Twain said, uh, all the loose marbles roll west. Uh, and what that means is that, uh, strangely, everywhere, uh, everybody is from somewhere else in Silicon Valley. And when you go to like a New York, Long Island country club, everybody wears the same clothes and has loafers and whatever. Uh, and, and Silicon Valley is quite different. Uh, when, uh, but, you know, what's also cool about it is that, you know, we don't really judge people. We judge people on their merit and what they're doing. When I first met uh, Cameron, uh, he, he was already a rock star. He was founding his second company, uh, Cirrus Logic. I was just a young banker kid uh, hoping to get his business. And, um, you know, I didn't think of him as being an Iranian. I didn't think of him as being anything but just a, you know, an amazing entrepreneur uh, that I wanted to work with. Uh, so I'd like, but just out of curiosity, I'd like to throw it out to Saeed and Pejman and others that have been operating in Silicon Valley. Um, have you have you all felt any challenges by not, you know, by being from Iran and any prejudices or any obstacles that you'd feel uh, someone say that grew up there like myself wouldn't have to contend with? You know, maybe I could start by saying that, you know, I think it's the only place on earth, I lived in East Coast before I came here. And in the East Coast, in the university, I was at Washington and Jefferson College in Pennsylvania they used to say there is three foreigners there. There was one Indian guy, one was me, and then there was one guy from Puerto Rico. And I used to tell them, the guy from Puerto Rico is not from overseas, he's you know, part of US. But <laughs> in California, I would say, in any company, we saw Broadcom, Marvel, more than 50% of the talent pool is not from here. And if anything, I would say they actually embrace diversity and different culture. And that's part of the really the magic of the Silicon Valley. And then occasionally when you want to do business, if I find the Iranian in the C-level executives, I said if my business is justifiable, we'll get it done. Because it actually opens a lot of doors, it opens a lot of uh, you know, sort of sense of community. And it really happens a lot more in the Israeli community. But I think our community is right up there trying to help each other and working together. So my message, Tony, is that if anything, I loved it, even during the hostage situation, if there was a stupid, uh, I will call it American, that sort of picked on me, the other American friends of mine would beat him up. So it was really good. <laughs> I actually agree with Said. I don't know, you don't have this Persian dish called Ashraj Teh, but I think Silicon Valley is, is like that. There are so many different things, but at the end it's so tasty and so good. And people don't care what is in it, they just know it's so good. And I think it's all about Silicon Valley, the same thing. You know, in other things, when we talk to top tier venture capital firm, when they see a founder is immigrant, is actually a big plus for them because they know they're hungrier, they are working harder, and the fact you leave your home, your family, your culture, your food, you come here, that's actually a big achievement, and many of us are here because of that. So I, I think being immigrant actually is a big plus here in Silicon Valley. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Sequoia Capital did a study, Sequoia Capital being one of the probably the, the top venture firm uh, in, our, in the Valley, uh, did a, a little research on you know where they've been most successful, and it was bad news for me because they said that they've had their greatest success funding 20-somethings that were immigrants. Uh, the two most uh, obvious were Jerry Yang, who was a Taiwanese uh, immigrant, and then Sergey Brin, who founded uh, Google. Uh, so, 
and I think the stat is, is that a third of all great Silicon Valley companies are founded uh, by immigrants. Um, maybe we could talk to our friends uh, from Iran. Um, Farad, uh, why might, uh, given your great uh, success, did you ever think about uh, coming to the United States uh, uh, to like start businesses or, or, or what was it that, obviously you've been very successful uh, in Iran, but what kept you there? Well, actually, I went to school in, in the UK, and I was there about 12 years. So um, I, um, I had this experience of being, being uh, away. But uh, um, during the time that I was in Iran, I saw a re revolution, I saw a war, I saw sanctions, I saw difficult times. And, uh, but at the same time, I have such great... Uh, admiration for the culture that um, Mr. Bulgarian showed, showed some of the greats of Iran there. It, you, when you walk in the Iranian street below the harshness of the day-to-day -day life, you see some very beautiful things. You see some mm, wonderful interaction between people and um, I would not I would not um, uh, change my life uh, for anything. I would, I would love to stay in Iran, and, and I love every minute of it. That's fantastic. <laughs> OK, uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, say something. Uh, Sharuk Shebani, who was supposed to be on this panel and had come uh, to Berkeley and the United States to be here with us had to go back to Tehran because his mother had passed away. So uh, let's all keep uh, Sharuk in our prayers and, uh, and pray for him and, and his uh, family situation there. So really sad to hear about that. Um, so uh, I'd like to just kind of continue on this theme. I mean, uh, do you think uh, there there when, what would it take for, do you think, to happen in the Iran for uh, venture capitalists from outside Iran to be interested in funding uh, Iranian companies? Are you talking to me as the taxi driver? Or? So, Just so any, me, any of the if, panelists. If so, let me, if I may say a little bit about plug and play, because I tried to keep to the three minutes over there, and my colleagues didn't. So, <laughs> so we kind of have helped about 20 countries, including Jordan, Egypt, uh, Chile, to sort of build their ecosystem. And I think like everybody, like Pejman mentioned, the culture is important, but the exposure to entrepreneurship and especially Silicon Valley form of entrepreneurship is really important. The two country that has done this the best is Singapore and Chile. In the case of Chile, they financed about 500 startups from US and around the world to go to Santiago. And they gave them $50,000 worth of stipend to live there and to build their little app. And you will be shocked what the effect that had in Santiago to see people from Germany, from US be there. And then of course they did a lot of meetups, a lot of startup stuff, and they initiated similar to Israel, like a mini seed funds through 15 different incubators. So my idea is not one thing we could do in Iran. We have to do everything. We have to have private incubators, we have to have bridge to Dubai, bridge to uh, Berlin, bridge to California. Sort of like, I love the name bridge. We actually have about 20 countries that we have a bridge to, and we bring from Turkey and Jordan 20 companies a year. They stay with us three months. If we like, we invest in them. If not, they go back. So the whole idea of building this ecosystem in Iran, it has, done, it has been done before. The best, I would say, it was in Israel 20 years ago. 
and now it was repeated by Chile and Singapore. So as a group in this room, I think this sh should be the beginning of our journey and we should really, like Pejman said, kind of do it for the future. I think some of us have had enough success that making another million dollar won't change our lifestyle. But if we can make a positive impact in like 100 young entrepreneurs life, I think that's the joy I am looking for. Yeah. Well, th th thank you, Saeed, for the time you lost in your introduction. You made up for that. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I always get my share. So, <laughs> we, we know. Uh, Re <laughs> Reza, do you, you want to say uh, something about uh, the opportunities for investing in Iran? Um, um. Well, one of the things I think is a foregone conclusion that the, there is a direct uh, proportionality and direct correlate, correlation between rule of law and prosperity in any uh, society. Uh, in regards to entrepreneurship, that can't be even more true that you have to have very strong laws, uh, you have to have uh, understanding about private contracts that are predictable, uh, repeatable. Uh, for example, one of the things that is essential to any entrepreneurship is a non-disclosure agreement. Before you have any idea that you want to go out there and raise money, you want to be able to trust somebody and that you can disclose it to someone and the laws would protect you that he would not disclose it. I have done some research on this subject in Iran and there is no law that governs non-disclosure agreements. And there's nobody knows that if I go out there and present my idea to somebody, whether they'll be protected or whether they would not be protected. And so those are the drawbacks that exist um, under current laws. But uh, I think, you know, um, again, th these are the things that you have to have uh, correct corporate laws, correct labor laws, and all these other things that need to be um, started. And I think this is, everybody knows that. And, and whether it's gonna succeed or not, I guess it all depends on the culture of entrepreneurship that we can create in Iran. So what, you know, I think the, the great advantage in Silicon Valley, if I might say, is that you can have an idea, whatever it is, and people will give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, they will start telling you, oh, that sounds interesting. Well, you should go talk to this person, that person, whatever. There, there's a way that you can take an idea and accelerate it really quickly. Um, the downside is it's very expensive living. You know, uh, development costs are very high here. Uh, so that creates opportunity all over the world. For instance, our platform is built in Vietnam where it's 35 bucks an hour instead of, what, $200 an hour for developers. What, in Iran, what, what would Iran's uh, case be for its competitive advantage? You know, what is it uh, about the culture and the people and the talent uh, that, you would, that you could sell to the rest of the world? Farouk? Yeah, any. Any of you? Yes, may I? Except no. Saeed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I kept it shut. Um, I think um, the uh, competitive advantage of uh, Iran is truly staggering because uh, you, you can have a good engineer, um, a good engineer, girl or boy. Um, there's there's uh, really probably more girls than, 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 than boys. Um, for about um, about six hundred dollars a month, so that really is. I don't think it can be matched with the quality of people. Um, I doubt it can be matched anywhere else. Um, not only this, but the network effect that uh, this has, because these young people they really are connected now. Uh, somebody mentioned the 3G and LTE. This, this just last week, this has been connected, uh, and the, the traffic is overwhelming. Um, uh, the SMS messages is absolutely staggering. As I said, six million a day on our part. So there is really a network of people uh, who uh, you can draw on, and the, the, not to mention the universities, um, uh, that are truly first rate. So uh, 
as far as the, the personnel and people are concerned, Iran really has a fantastic advantage. I cannot say that about the regulations that are cumbersome, the, the, the bandwidth that is, uh, better not mention it, and so on. So the, I, I cannot uh, vouch for the other uh, parameters and, and factors, but on this one, uh, definitely on, on the personnel side, if a mechanism can be um, worked out that people could work online, uh, remotely, and so on, I think it really is a fantastic place to do business. Yeah, um, you know, in the last uh, 22 or three, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, John, uh, the PhD program at Stanford University, the electrical department, engineering department, the highest acceptance every year is from Sharif University, every single year. Um, this is, yeah, this is true. This is not me. This is data is out there. It's more than Stanford itself, Harvard, Oxford, Yale, you name it. So I think there is, there's a huge talent in Iran. I actually don't believe there is a lack of capital in Iran. I don't think there is lack of people who want to take the risk in Iran. I think maybe you, should, you could have said that 10 years ago, but things have changed. People taking risk, people are willing to take risk. I think there's a lack of exposure to the very young, talented, hungry people in Iran who should have the choice to, to make a change in their world. And I think it's our obligation here in Iran to help them to achieve that. So I, I, for our final question, I'd like to pick up on that uh, Pejman's last comment. Uh, one of the earliest, most successful immigrant communities in Silicon Valley uh, was the Indian community. And uh, great heroes like Vinod Kosla, who founded Sun Microsystems and was a partner at Kleiner and now his own venture firm, Kosla Ventures, has done a lot about going back to India and investing in education and micropayments and doing whatever he can uh, to contribute back to his home country. Um, what, what can successful uh, Iranians in the U.S. do to contribute back uh, to the home country? Okay, Saeed? My turn is up. You know, I really think, uh, frankly, myself, my brother, most of my friends here, they have a tie to Iran that is incredibly strong. I think if uh, just they felt comfortable, recently one of our friends just went back with his whole family for three, four days and came. But they all wanna go back. They all wanna invest in Iran. They all wanna teach what they have learned overseas in Iran. The main reason China has gone through this incredible growth is from Taiwan, Hong Kong, the overseas Chinese that not only went back to China with money, but they went back to China with experience. So I just hope in November there will be some solution to our relationship together with Iran. But I really think every one of us, at least the people I have talked to heart to heart, they would like to go back and take 10, 20% of what they have made or knowledge back to home. So that's my opinion. We just have to ease the sanction and let it happen. Following this, I think I, I would like to, uh, to emphasize on the value of partnership. Uh, Iran's business environment is a very sophisticated one. It's a little bit awkward. So from outside, it's very hard to arrive there with the mind which is not sort of cultivated in that environment, try to be effective. So uh, the cases I have seen are people who bring the inspiration, they bring the vision from outside, but they work jointly with someone who knows the details of the legal structure there, the market structure there. So my suggestion would be, I think and we are, I see the great opportunity there. I see that the banking system and the VC system, PE system is building capacity for bringing people on. Capital is there. People who have the textbook knowledge are there. And when, when I see young Iranians, their knowledge is up to the point we teach here in the US. What they are lacking is this implicit knowledge, you know, the, the wisdom coming from the experience. And I think if people going there find their partners, and I think people here, including our association, we are ready there to find the right partners. That would be the most effective model I have seen. Great. 
Okay, I think we're out of time. I, I just want to wrap up by saying that, um, you know, I've had the blessing of working and, and having friends uh, from Iran, uh, Saeed and Kayvon Baruman, who's here, Neda, uh, Cameron. Uh, and, I, you know, my observation has always been there's, a, there's always, they, they all have a deep love for their home country and had, you know, gone through the revolution and had their own experiences that were very unsettling. Uh, and, and hard, and uh, you know, I, I, there was a statistic that said, you know, entrepreneurship and frankly, democratic capitalism uh, is is a thing that ties countries together. Uh, an interesting stat is uh, companies that have McDonald's don't go to war against each other. Uh, <laughs> that's a strange thing. Uh, page one. No, when you finish. Okay, so I I just want to say that uh, as witness here the the. The good will and the, and the cheerfulness and, and, the, and the jokes and all that, that's very unique to the Iranian culture as far as I see and the, and the lovingness. And uh, we just appreciate uh, both uh, you all that have come here and done great things and appreciate those of you who are here from Iran today. Uh, and it's why I would never leave Silicon Valley. We can do this. Um, and entrepreneurship is a great way uh, and a great system bring us all together. So with that, I want to turn over. You know, to I have Israel. encouraging data here. Um, you know, Said and I had uh, really the, the pleasure and opportunity to work with a lot of Iranian founders at Amidzad and we see to them. Today, um, the, the value of private tech companies founded by Iranians in the U.S. is over $20 billion. And, and that's really staggering. So thank you, all of you. With that, thank you very much. One 20-second comment from Aghira Hama, may I say, and then we'll go to break. Um, since um, we are Iranians and we have been, some of them, uh, some of us uh, away from Iran, perhaps just a quick um, uh, reminder would be uh, a little piece from Molavi, if I may, very quickly. It says, hearken to the reed forlorn, breathing even since it was, it was torn, from its rushy bed and strain of impassioned love and pain. The secret of my song, though near, none can see and none can hear. Oh, for a friend to know the sign and mingle all his soul with mine. Tis a wine of love inspired me. Tis a flame of love that burnt me. Wouldst thou learn how lovers bleed? Hearken, hearken to the reed. There's always time for Molana. <laughs> Thank you again to our panelists, to our moderator. Please go get some fresh air. We know it's warm in here. Grab some choy, some fruit, and please be back here in about 20 minutes. Thank you.